Hello, everybody. Welcome. Happy Thursday. I hope you're doing well. I am Teresa Micheletti, the marketing and social media manager for The Circle Phone. Um, we're very glad you're here, whether you watch this currently live with us or later, um, we're happy you're here. So today we are going to get to discuss um, a couple designs, hopefully, at least one. Um, there was a miscommunication that's on me. So our thumbnail that says we only have Eduardo Villa is not correct. So let's find out who else we have. But first, we need to, I need to introduce the lady who leads it all, Christina Sear, our CEO. Hi. Hi, I'm Christina Sear, CEO. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here and it's great to have you here with us. Mm -hmm. So our first designer here, and I'll let him in. Um, one. Welcome. Hi there. How's it going? Good. How about yourself, Nick? Not bad. My name's Nick Ibergen. Christina, Nick I got one of your, I saw one of your previous, uh, when you're announcing the winners, you yes. announced my last name perfectly. <sighs> Yes, yes. <laughs> that's great. And I saw it and you did great. <laughs> thank you. And Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. So uh, not only was it uh, Teresa doing the thumbnail, it was also uh, me. I had heard back from you on Monday. Uh, I heard back from Eduardo like last week. And so um, we got Eduardo's thumbnail uh, per prepared, but then I didn't get back to her, Teresa, until yesterday. And then we didn't know that her email was uh, not sending or receiving. Anyways, I deeply apologize. Uh, we will doubly promote you <laughs> after this. <laughs> so uh, please rest assured that we will make it up on our end. But uh, I apologize. It's, it's at least not in the intro today. Um, my it's fault always, as well. So it's always a um, when like our tech doesn't work being a smartphone company, which it happens to everybody. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> If you're like, oh. oh, that never happens to me, I probably disagree. But anyway, it's always a little like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's it everybody, it's, I work from home, tech problems all the time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Because one thing about the My Mini Factory contest was that frequently people wouldn't even use their real name. And we didn't even know like if we wanted to promote them on social media, like what social media channels they were on. and uh, so that was hard for us because we really like to promote other people. And so um, we felt a little helpless in that way. So can you tell us more about what you do and what inspired you to join the contest? Sure. Um, well, uh, for my work, uh, I work at a um, plastic injection mold company. Uh, we designed the plastic injection molds. Um, so I'm a designer on a team and Every day we kind of just, uh, um, we get, we work from mainly automotive. Okay. So any type of, uh, any company basically, I've probably helped design uh, an injection mold for at least something in their car. And wow. we, we go from uh, fascias to door panels to cup holders to anything. Um, so that's my career. Uh, I am a avid 3D printer. Uh, I kind of just, uh, I take my design life and I bring it home and I just design things to 3D print. Um, I also uh, own a hobby CNC out in my garage. So I make things for that as well. Um, so I, kinda, I just make <laughs> is, is one of my big things. And what kind of CNC machine do you have? Uh, it's a... Um, Carbide 3D, okay. uh, a Shapoko. Uh, it, so Carbide 3D is the company. It's a uh, Shapoko XXL. Uh, so they're okay. just size. Okay, sorry, you see, you see me secretly like taking notes over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded, so we can always go back. Note, note taker. That's right. We already have the recording, but for some <laughs> reason, I just live on my notes still. Um, and then, how long have you been doing that? Did you do anything before? Uh, you so, work at the so injection company. I've been um, I've been in the uh, automotive industry for about 
eight years now. I started out of high school as a machinist and I did uh, four years of machining. Um, during that, I decided that I wanted to go back to school. I was doing my apprenticeship and then I decided that machining wasn't for me. I wanted to, I always liked design work while I was in school. So I decided to go for uh, automotive product design um, okay. in college. And then I did that. Um, the company that I worked for while I was in college, I ended up, uh, it was a jig and fixture shop. So I ended up going into their design department. And uh, from there, once I graduated college, I went to um, the company I'm at now. Okay. And then, um, so I was wondering if we could jump into your design. And I wanted to ask you about what tools you use to model it. Sure. Um, Tools-wise, it was uh, Katia. Um, okay. I, I, we work with, uh, at my company, we work with uh, Katia V5. So okay. that's what I'm familiar with. I do uh, work with Fusion 360, but if I have access to a stronger uh, design software, then I, I go with that, basically. So, um, and then uh, I do have my design here. <laughs> Fantastic. So, and then Oh, go ahead. Oh, and it's CNC'd? Is that what you said? Uh this one, this is 3D printed. Okay. Yeah, so I um this is the updated version of it. Uh the one that I had on uh, my mini factory, um mm -hmm. I was I was missing uh the ribs on this side. Um and then there was a couple other what I did as well is um, this here is uh, the circle phone, um, the screen, the uh, the board, and basically um, a simplified version of the innards of the circle phone that you provided to the My Mini Factory contest. So decided to print that out so I could see all of it uh, fit together basically. That, that's really cool because it looks a little bit wider, uh, the model that you just showed up, that you uh, um, showed, looks a little bit wider than uh, what I saw in your design. Uh, no, actually. This is, is it really the same? The only thing that I did was uh, I changed the, um, I added the ribs. Okay. Um, I think the only thing that, that is different with this one that was, mm -hmm. uh, that the pictures were taken before was I just added the ribs and then okay. I and then printing this so I could see what it looked like on the inside. Um, yes, and having that teal display show through the blue frame uh, really makes it look wide to me. Uh, it's really? kind of like a trick of the eye or trump de la and right. yeah, exactly. That's amazing. It's kind of cool though because it, it looks kind of reflective. Did you print the the innards in, um, you probably already said this, but did you print it all in PLA or? Yeah, so uh, the the inside is a um, silk green PLA. Uh, okay. So the silk kind of, kind of gives it a, yes. a smoother a smoother look. It, it, Iridescent um, look, yeah. Exactly, and it, uh, it feels different than regular PLA, like kind of rubbing my hand back here. It, it prints the same. It, it acts the same, it has the same melting temperature. It just, it kind of feels different. It's a little bit shinier, it's a, it's a nice filament. I like it quite a bit actually. Mm -hmm. um, this little is the only color I have in it though. <laughs> right, a little bit smoother, I've noticed when I get those kind of pearlized uh, PLA filaments. Right. Um, it's kind of nice. So uh, I need to check in with Teresa here. Eduardo did join us. Uh, he's waiting uh, backstage. So do you mind if we just show his face uh, just to say hi? And we're going to um, excuse him for a second while we go over here. Yes, yes, of course. Welcome, Eduardo. Hello, welcome. Hello, how are you? How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so sorry for being late. I, I missed the email. So I, I actually thought that it was canceled or that something had happened. Yes, so, yes but... something did happen and it was on our <laughs> end. Was broken. We deeply apologize. Normally, uh, we get those links out the day before. Uh, it's um, 
yeah, a big uh, what series of unfortunate events. So yeah, no problem. <laughs> Good to be here. So I apologize. Okay, thank you. We're gonna excuse you and have you go backstage again because uh, we would like to see Nick's uh, design in in detail. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll see Thanks you soon. All right. Okay. Sorry, we're interrupting you three times, Nick. I'm sorry, <laughs> so apologize. It's perfectly fine. It's I'm used to this from uh, from work, and basically half the uh, half of our design team is at work, and then the other half's at home, and we get interrupted all the time. It, it happens. <laughs> it's true. I think our tolerance and our patience for that is growing substantially uh, the longer that we're all in quarantine. Mm -hmm. I have to ask before we go over your design, may I ask what's behind you? Uh, our, which? On the wall or? All of it. Okay. Well, so uh, three weeks ago, um, my basement flooded. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so okay. I actually have you turned right now. So I'm okay. sitting at my desk on an angle because uh, everything's torn out. We, we um, I work in the basement and uh, so uh, this was our finished section. We had a whole living room down here and I had a, a nice large, um, I went and bought uh, an island countertop and uh, uh, a, eight foot long countertop and I made my own desk out of it. So I had a nice big desk and everything. And then the flood came through and I had to throw it all away. <laughs> so unfortunately I'm, I'm doing renovations upstairs. So the nice thing is I took carpet out of one of our bedrooms and I brought it down here. So I'm sitting, I get to at least have carpet. Otherwise I'd be on spent floor. <laughs> so that back there is, is our couch that kind of I saved and was able to uh, keep good. And then this is, um, this might seem a little bit much, but this is, uh, I own, uh, I have a, a Husky, a Siberian Husky, Australian Shepherd mix. Yes. And this is his cage. Um, he's a Houdini. <laughs> so he's broken three, uh, three uh, wire frame cages. He's bent the door and gotten out. Uh, so, and he has a, a high anxiety during storms. That so, sounds like a husky. <laughs> yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> so to keep him safe, we uh, we had to buy this cage. So it, everything is tight enough that he can't get his like teeth around anything because he's he's broken about five teeth, um, biting at uh, biting at the cage. Yeah. <laughs> he's right. So intelligent. And Teresa knows more than I do about dogs. <laughs> yeah. It's just perhaps fair. <laughs> Absolutely. And then uh, this here is uh, uh, a piece that I've seen seed. Um, so this is uh, off of um, Thingiverse. Uh, there's yeah. a, a guy who put this um, marble calendar stone is what he called it. And so uh, I just, um, this was uh, using a uh, 90 degree um, V curve to get this. So it's got basically um, like Deadpool, Iron Man, just all your different Marvel heroes. So it's so good. That's that's it beautiful. Is so good. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Thank you for letting us geek out a little bit there. <laughs> no problem. If I'd be able to show you a lot of things, but all of it's in storage now. So <laughs> <laughs> that's unfortunate but uh we're gonna slowly we're still in the process of claiming uh talking to insurance company and all that so uh, soon hopefully i'm i'm hoping to start rebuilding what i had down here <laughs> you're recovering nicely so well let's go ahead and look at your design and talk about your design a little bit more sure um do you want why to did you put iron man on the back of it that's why i want to know I have a confession. <laughs> I didn't have much time with this. <laughs> I went on vacation. Um, I went on vacation. Uh, so I started the design and then it wasn't much time to actually design it. And then I realized I'm going on vacation. So I just started throwing everything in and I was like, it's good. Send it. <laughs> so. There, there could have been a little bit extra to it. I just, I didn't have time. 
That's fine. Let's go ahead and go over it here. So uh, what uh, inspired you? I really liked how you split up the kind of, you had the speaker hole down at the bottom and then you had the speaker holes up at the top. Uh, so the inspiration to that was um, just kind of packaging. Uh, I wasn't, so I knew that the speaker up top um, based on your design. So I kind of based my, the, the holes for it um, off of your design because you had on either side of uh, the camera, um, you had uh, holes there to, to hear from. So I, I like that idea. I like everything being uniform. So I, I wanted to get those holes there. And then, but by doing that, I wanted to make sure that um, the, the, uh, speaker for like uh, watching videos and everything. It wasn't um, there as well. I just, I thought it was too clustered basically. Mm -hmm. It's kind of why I decided to put one down at the bottom, one at the top. Mm -hmm. That made sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then Teresa, can we go to the next slide or? Awesome, thank you. Uh, and then what did you think about the dual headphone jacks? I thought it was interesting. It's, uh, <laughs> word for it. it caught me off guard. I, I saw it and I was like, huh, um, it makes sense. You know, uh, nowadays, um, it might not be like everyone has their own iPods and everything like that. But mm -hmm. I remember back when I was in school, having a splitter, plugging uh, two sets of headphones into, into a phone and, and yes. listening to music or, or watching yes. something. And, and so not needing that splitter for, for two headphones, I was like, I'm down for this idea. That's good. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Yes, I noticed that uh, kind of Gen Z was buying up headphone jack splitters. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of, that's a little retro because I haven't seen people do that in the last, like, you know, like maybe eight years ago I did that. And then, uh, right. and then to see it happening again, that was interesting to me. Um, of course, this is pre COVID, you know, mm -hmm. when we actually sit next to somebody and share our music or videos with somebody. And then also I think with the dropping age of, uh, cell phone usage, you know, from the first time you get your cell phone from the age of 12 has dropped down to the age of six in places like Australia. So um, oh. having siblings able to share uh, mm -hmm. headphone jacks, I, I think also uh, is beneficial. So, uh, but back to your design. So below the headphone jack, I see a hole. Is that a microphone uh, egress uh, or? Okay. So, um, I have a microphone uh, hole on both sides, so it doesn't matter if you're holding it this way or the other way, uh, you're gonna be speaking into the hole. Um, and that was the instruct instructions off of my mini factory was, uh, it was very clear with making sure that you had um, both those and then seeing the, uh, the step file um, and actually uh, manipulating the step file of, of the circle phone. I, I saw both microphones, so I was like, well, I'm fine with where they are. It makes sense, so I'll just give an access hole to them right there. That's really smart, and uh, probably you could uh, pick up the voice easier than the enclosure that, just the ready enclosure that I quickly put together. <laughs> but um, the other thing that I didn't mention in the details is one of the microphones, actually the egress is on the back of the board. Um, so I'd never seen a microphone like that. And so I kind of wanted to play with it a little bit, uh, and see which one we like better. Um, so one of them, uh, the egress is on the back of the board, which makes absolutely no sense at all, uh, when you have it put <laughs> together, but normally in testing, we butterfly it out. Um, oh. and so, uh, we're able to test both, uh, sides. Um, so yeah, it was it was just interesting. I'll be changing that in the final uh, edition, but um, but it was fun to play with for a while. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next uh, image. All right, the back. So you chose to put the screws in from the back, and a lot of designers did that. Can you talk to me about that? So I had in the original 
print. A um, couple slides later, you'll have sl uh, pictures of my original uh, black and orange print that I did. That didn't have those screw holes. That was the first iteration that I had. And um, based on 3D printing, I just, I decided that the tabs, because uh, I knew that there was going to be a drop test. So the tabs just wouldn't be strong enough um, to withstand a drop test. So I, I abandoned that idea. I kept, um, I kept the, so there's all around, I have uh, raised lips that uh, make it so it, it kind of um, forces the housing to go together properly. Um, so Reed, I, would you mind uh, enlarging Nick so we can see uh, what he's talking about? Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> see if we can do this. Uh, so my, uh, there, there we go. We go. Thank you. Uh, so, Oops. <laughs> oh, are we back? All right, there we go. Yeah, so I have ribs that are all around. So basically this rib here, I had a hook on it and on the opposite side. And so all around this design, I have different ribs. So when the phone goes together, um, put it down. so basically I can hook onto that and then it just, drops it into place um, and it's, it locates basically. Um, but because of how 3D printing works and it's, it's layer after layer, um, this becomes a weak point the, for bending it because of how it's printed, it has strong bending, but for this to work as a hook, it would have had to be printed like this because then my lines would have been going around so since this is impractical to print this way, um, it, it, the, the hook just, it, it, it didn't make sense. It, um, I broke it right away. I gave it like the, the wiggle stress test and, and I just, it, for it to work, it would be, need to be more robust for 3D printing. Is, Thank you for explaining that to our audience. That's a really important point that we ran into. A lot of the snap fits just weren't working because we would be printing it on its back. Mm -hmm. So um, exactly what you're talking about. You would need to print it on its side for the snap fits to really be strong enough. Right. Um, but then it would become a 30-hour print for no reason. You'd have to have uh, so much support material that uh, you'd be spending half your time just uh, more than half your time taking off support material and cleaning up the the print. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to your design. Let's see, because I think you have a few more uh, photos here. And Teresa, do you mind um, paging through the, thank you. Teresa is her previous profession was stage manager. So she, oh. she's great at the staging stuff. Right. Like when I ask her to stuff do stuff that she's never done before, she's like, oh, okay, let's figure this out. <laughs> but we just need to see the next picture. So this is the picture from the back. And this is the exploded view. Uh, the exploded views are always super sexy when you do a design contest and you get to see the exploded view. It's just really cool. Uh, has a lot of drama to it. So can you talk to me about the buttons? Uh, I saw that you were one of the designers who successfully kind of put a gasket uh, on the underneath of the button uh, before it extends out of the uh, enclosure. Can you talk to us about that? And maybe that has a lot to do with your automotive uh, experience. Um, so I, the buttons itself, I was relying on the, uh, I wasn't exactly sure. See, I've never worked with phones. I'm not really a product designer. I take the products and I make the mold for it. So this was fun because I, I very rarely get to, I get to tell the product designers um, what they need to do to make their part moldable, but it's small tweaks. It's not like I'm changing the whole thing. Uh, so this size, I was under the impression that the button itself is going to, be the spring. So I, I just, all I started with was just a post that was 
pushed right up against the button and I went, all right, so now what? <laughs> and then I kind of just, I, I thought to myself, I grabbed my own phone and I was like, okay, so I need the button to protrude a little bit, but I don't need it too much. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of just broke down uh, each step and I just kind of slowly added to the button. And then I had it there. And, and once I had the button, I kind of started processing through like saying, okay, so what stops it from coming out um, there? And then the buttons were, once I had one, it, all of them were basically the same thing. And then uh, having the posts in the uh, on the housing itself that, uh, that the button uh, nests into, I kind of, that was a shot in the dark. I was like, I think this would work. I think there needs to be more support to it because it's, all it is is a square with uh, with the shape of the button uh, cut out of it, um, of, of the post. Mm -hmm. So it would need more, it would be need to be more robust, but the general idea is there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, I really liked how you allowed space on the in interior of the back enclosure for the gasket itself uh, mm -hmm. before piping the post uh, through to the PCB. Uh, that was that was an extra element that I I thought was a nice touch. Uh, even granted that you didn't have very much very much time to design this, uh, that was really nice that you didn't overlook that. So I've looked at a lot of uh, smartphone buttons, and they are tremendously complex. I had a feeling I, it would be, I couldn't. I I searched online. I couldn't find one. I was like, eh, I'm not going to open my own phone, so I'll just make up make this up on the spot. <laughs> right. And even like the iPhone four, uh, the buttons there, they have like a, this drop down hinge on top of it. I mean, it's like, it's super complex. And, uh, I feel like I've just scratched the surface, uh, on button design when I look at how complicated, uh, their designs are. So bravo, you did a nice job, especially with the limited amount of time that you had. So, uh, let's see if I, is there a picture right after this? I think you said of the orange model. We yeah. have the other side, the other side. I think that's it. Okay. Oh, there it is. There it is. So I really like that you printed this out and you had it in front of a keyboard so we could get a sense of scale mm -hmm. uh, because people's hand sizes are so different. You right. know, you have like a really large hand or a really petite hand. So uh, just having the keyboard and the mouse uh, behind it uh, really gave us a sense of scale there. And as you know, I contacted you privately afterwards to find out, you know, what happened to the ribbing on the right hand side. And <laughs> uh, you said it was getting in uh, interfering with the USB ports. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was a nice um, just quick way to allow access for the USB ports there. So that was great. Um, and then how did you know how to form that ribbing? Did you have inspiration from another consumer electronic product that you saw or you just guessed? Uh, triangles are strong. That's, that's basically how I went with that. Um, I'm not actually very fond of what I've done here. So there's, there's multiple reasons that, uh, for my, my ribbing, um, I wasn't sure and maybe you can enlighten me on this. So you have your all your innards for your phone, your screen, your motherboard, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. What does this mount to? It just sits nests inside in the casing, right? So my thought was all these exterior ribs I have lipped. So there, there's a um, a one mil step inside them. So when this gets nested down in here it if i make that right it holds so assembly wise it's gonna hold it's not much of a hold but it's enough that basically with a little bit of pressure down you can easily it's gonna sit there and then you can assemble the rest of the phone um and then the all these ribs here are just so when you're actually on your phone and you're you're pressing on it, you don't want anything to to bow down. So you, so you want that back support on the screen uh, is kind of what my thought was. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's brilliant. So if, um, yeah, I wished that for the first iteration, this is our fourth iteration, uh, my fourth iteration since, let's see, the first one was uh, December 2018. So, uh, and we've done one practically every quarter uh, in 2019. Uh, and this last one's lasted us a long time. It's lasted us since December, 2019, but uh, I am dying to add um, screw holes to the PCB because I thought it could just snap in. And when we went to design the case again and again and again, the snap fits, uh, the same thing that you talked about would just shear off and uh, it didn't work out. Uh, and the other thing that I did not design into the board were places where, um, uh, even if you design something to push the board down, there's no place on the board. There's no empty space on the board. I saw that. Yes. Anything <laughs> pushing against the, uh, against the board. Uh, you're on valuable real estate. If you're putting any standoffs, I managed to sneak in, as you saw in the design that I open sourced, uh, I managed to put two right above the each headphone jack. Mm -hmm. um, it have a little square space there on each side of the printed circuit board. But wow, I've learned so much and uh, so much more to go, really, <laughs> for the design. So um, definitely a great second phone. And uh, I can't wait till our third. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Teresa, do we have any pictures past the, yes, we have another one here. And uh, just, do you have any final comments that you want to talk to us about? Uh, sure. Uh, so in the, um, watching the stream of when you announced the top nine, uh, you commented on the shape of the phone and you were hundred percent right. Uh, I play a lot of video games. I, uh, I'm constantly thinking about how things, so you get concerned about, I will admit, I was a little concerned about the size of the phone. When you said it needed to be four inches wide, I was like, that's that's pretty big. Yes. And if we get somebody who has smaller hands, like I, a full grown man compared to a full grown woman, their, their hands are completely different. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to basically uh, notch out these areas kind of so it would rest nicely in where your thumb is. So you could, no matter what, you, you could easily get to all sides of the screen if it's sideways or upright. So it, it's kind of, that was me trying to get gaming but also like you need to be able to text on this thing you need to be able to do everything so like yes. I, we're not gonna nobody wants to sit there and, and stab at their phone they want to text like a normal person so i, I wanted to get that kind of slim that down so you can get your hand uh sitting nicer um and then the one other thing uh with the design of this phone i was concerned about assembly so the you commented on how i had i spent the time to cut around so if i could go back and redo this i think i would make it tighter because what i ended up doing was i followed all your pieces for assembly and for uh, potentially having this as a plastic injection piece later in the future because um, as soon as you have an undercut in in uh, plastic so as soon as you have basically um, your say this was being um, shot this way so mm -hmm. this is all steel that's this in is, um, Teresa can we do a close-up on Nick please for this this is really important thank you <laughs> <laughs> so we'll imagine that our mold is this is standing up in our mold and so this is the split between well i guess sorry so i guess this is the split between our core and cavity um and so core and cavity that's just uh, the, how we uh determine what side of the tool we're talking about 
how do we form, so all the steel that we cut away is to form this piece. So how do you form this piece in here if you have steel all in here? The steel doesn't let the piece eject out of the tool. So you need to create an action that basically is in here that can be removed so this piece can get ejected out. So by not having any, um, any of our openings on the sides uh, as full rounds, that per makes it so the tool is cheaper and easier to run because it's gonna be cheaper to design, cheaper to manufacture. Uh, and then there's no, uh, now you don't, <laughs> Potentially, there's no hydraulics, there's no, like, you've really reduced the cost of what a injection mold is going to cost you. Um, That's fascinating because, um, so I don't know if the audience can hear me when I'm off stage, but can, you can hear me though, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's interesting to me that those people who had experience, those designers that had experience with injection molding before, they made sure that the ports were open, they, they did not have the overhang uh, to the ports. So just like you're talking about. So uh, since I don't have a lot of experience with injection molding, I would not have thought of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that you pointed that out. Um, that's going to be important, especially if we receive more than 500 orders and need to go to injection molding. Injection molding is, is like 30 seconds and you have a part compared to Yes. Uh, it took me five hours to print out my clothes. So. It's so true. So in your mind, what would be the cutoff point, uh, particularly for our phone, uh, for the number of orders? At what point would you switch to injection molding? In the thousands. Because um, really, so if, with mine, um, five hours to print. If you get a print farm with 30 printers or, or whatever, then, mm -hmm. then so... You get 30 phones all printed in five hours. Mm -hmm. That's that's a lot of manpower. That's a lot of time and energy. Like you, you have to think about your overhead costs because mm -hmm. now you're you're paying the electricity bill for all 30 printers to be heated up to 200 degrees for mm -hmm. the uh, hot end and 50 degrees for the the bed. You mm -hmm. have to uh, pay somebody to do it. You have to pay mm -hmm. for all that plastic. Mm -hmm. um and like you're talking days where if you have um you could run for five hours with a plastic injection machine and you have over five thousand parts like it depending on your cycle depending on because plastic injection um if you make a larger tool then you can have um you can have multiple cavity tools so you could actually if you're uh injecting everything as the same color then you could have like four backs four four fronts all in one machine and so you could in 30 seconds you have four full cases done instantly and this is an interesting segue to eduardo because he actually works for an additive manufacturing uh, facility in mexico uh so and you work for an injection molding facility so uh could we bring eduardo on and um uh talk about that a little bit hey eduardo so uh nick before we let you go is so i know for the 3d prints uh you know when we do them at home there's a lot of finishing work that i have to do like there's threads everywhere that i have to like sand down and each piece takes a lot of care um for injection molding um i my college roommate used to work at uh, plastics uh, injection molding facility. And she said that they had to cut uh, some of that like um, balls, plastic balls and stuff that were made as toys. Um, so they had to cut the seams off and things like that. Right. So uh, no matter what, you're going to at least have to cut. Um, I guess it depends on your plastic because so no matter what, there is a inlet of plastic into uh, your part. So you have your part and the company decides, okay, we want to direct drop. So they could direct drop. So if you ever look at uh, a cap on a water bottle, there is a little, um, there's, there's a dimple on the top and then there might be a piece of like wispy plastic. plastic. 
uh, that uh, required no cutting because that is a um, it's a direct drop. So there's a um, an inlet right on the top with a pneumatic uh, piece that basically it pulls a pin back. The plastic flows in. It pushes the pin back, and so the pin is what stops your flow of plastic. So you'll you'll be left with a little vestige, but the vestige is is almost negligible because of of how small it is. Um, that's only for direct drops. For non-direct drops, we have different variations of of gating where you could have a fan gate, which is basically um, like we have uh, standard runners. Uh, so the runner is what lets the plastic flow in. So a standard okay. runner is going to be about like eight mil, uh, 10 mil in diameter. And then it's going to either fan out and, and get more, or it's gonna, a fan gate basically means you're going from uh, a round runner to a flat fan that kind of hits the edge and then lets the plastic flow. So uh, we get mold flows run that um, will throw in what the gating looks like and then it will run an analysis and basically show you like okay these this is your gas trap areas um this is where your uh it's going to show you the heat uh of the because we're we have to cool the plastic down um at a decent rate because you're injecting packing the plastic the packing of the plastic is what uh, uh you want the plastic to be uh so dense so it's not just like flimsy it won't fall apart so you have to pack so much in and mm -hmm. then um and then it has to cool so with the gates that are on the side you can fan gate uh there's gates that are to pins there's gates that are cashews cashews are interesting because they actually um when you eject the part they cut themselves off Okay, I think Nick, I think I got you started and I'm worried about both your right. time and Eduardo's time. Uh, so I apologize to cut you off, but Eduardo, and I said that you work for an add additive manufacturing facility, but you're actually uh, multi-jet printers. Exactly. Uh, so I'm sorry, pardon me? No, 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 go ahead. Um, so can you tell us more about that? Yes, uh, as I told you on email, I work at uh, what we do where I work. It's called Boja 3D. Uh, we do additive manufacturing, but on an industrial scale. This means that we don't have uh, a, only FDM machines, but we work with something called multi-jet fusion, which is a technology developed by HP. And what it does is instead of working with a filament, it works with a powder with plastic powder. And what it does is there's a big uh, print head that goes over the uh, powder and it sprays uh, like a 2D printer. It sprays uh, kind of like ink. And then uh, we have like these big lamps with a lot of power that they melt the plastic. And so uh, that's, that's the process. It goes uh, as with all added manufacturing, it goes uh, one layer at a time. And I have, uh, I actually have some results in here. So this oh, is kind of what we, what we do in here. I mean, what is great about this is the level of detail that you can achieve. I mean, as you can see, well, I yes. have like two drive ones in here. Hold it, uh, slowly for us to see that detail. Thank you. Perfect. That detail is re really remarkable. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And the parts are actually quite durable. I mean. If you try to break yeah. this, you are going to have a hard time, especially mm -hmm. with this, which is a big thicker. So because the adhesive that they use is super strong. Yeah, yeah, they they are pretty strong. I mean, we mm -hmm. uh, we in the factory we have produced parts that are meant to replace aluminum in in places where aluminum was maybe a bit too much. So we have designed parts that are uh, actually made for that. And it's amazing because you can, I mean, not go into quite plastic injection uh, level of production, but you can stay on the several uh, hundred pieces and still be competitive uh, price-wise. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the technology is quite amazing. It enables you to do a lot of stuff. And, yeah, I mean, this is what I do.
Yes, the detail and also the coloration is just amazing. Uh, some of the HP uh, uh, machines had, can do multicolors. And we were really excited about that because we were like, maybe we can do like a rainbow, uh, you know, enclosure for ours. And uh, so I was really disappointed to talk with the HP representative to find out that the adhesive that's used is carbon based and that that does affect our antenna signal. So, um, you know, what can we do? Can we put it on the facing and then have the back be black? You know, I, I, I don't know. But I, I think for uh, any sort of uh, product that does not have to worry about getting that signal out. It's a great intermediary between uh, 3D printing at home or even professionally and uh, injection molding. So if you do 500 units, which is kind of our break point right there, um, uh, it, it's a good solution uh, right there for most other products. So I was really disappointed. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was such a such a, a shame because yeah, what 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 it enables you to do is done in best before you actually have to do it in a mold because molds are uh, they can be expensive. So what this enables you to do is just to test your product and then you go into into injection molding. Once you know that you have everything defined and that you actually. Uh, have a value proposition, then you go into injection molding and then you spend the big money. And then we haven't even scratched the surface on uh, on both of these technologies because I want to like ask you for like the next hour about like silicon molds versus, you know, metal molds and like uh, also the uh, different kinds of HP machines because the machines that you use are different than some of the machines that are used uh, in our area. And so um, I yeah. really like to talk about all that so um but i would i also want to get to your design eduardo uh so if we sure. could go ahead uh nick we're gonna go ahead and excuse you if you need to go that that's fine or if you want to stay on uh at the end and talk a little bit more about injection molding we would love to hear more um so uh thank you so much for talking about your design nick i really appreciate oh, it thank you very much Eduardo, let's go ahead and go over your design. Sure. And uh, Teresa, uh, when you get a chance, if you could show uh, Eduardo's design. Thank you. Yeah, really. So as you heard me gush, I just really thought that this was a cool, it was a very cute shape uh, and uh, very exciting. So uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what inspired you? Sure. I mean, uh, as I already told you by email, I, I have a process which was a, a process developed here in, in Mexico in a design studio that I actually used to work. And wh what we always did in there is find what is the soul, let's call it like that, the soul of the product. So the first thing I did was a mental map about the product. And uh, what this enables me to do, I mean, it is in Spanish, sorry. But what this enables me to do is to find like keywords, keywords that later are going to be uh, fundamental to actually develop a concept behind the design of the product. So the words that I came up uh, for this, uh, for the circle phone was human, unusual, connections, personal, and unique. And based on that, I, I started to see how people actually use their phones. Uh, and I, uh, I mean, that was like the the main area of focus that I had, how people actually use a phone and how people would use a circle phone because it is really different. So, mm -hmm. and then the first thing I did was actually I printed the current phone. I'm sorry, it's missing the back, but I, I, I did this. And what I did with this is what, uh, just pretend that it was my phone, okay? So I carried around in my back and I, I only had like four or five days to develop this. So I really had to go fast. So I did this on the first day and I was carrying it for the first day. And what I found out was that uh, the shape, because we don't have like these curves uh, behind the phone, it was really hard for everybody 
to uh, use it with just one hand, okay? If you use it like this, I mean, you can hold it, but you cannot use it. If you try to use it, it slips. So you actually need the two hands. So that that was like my eureka moment. And when I, 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 I actually said, well, this is what I'm going to try to attack. This is what I, want, I am going to try to solve. So once I already had this, once I already had the, uh, really quick user research that I did, I started to kind of like make some sketches. So I made some quick sketches. I printed like what was the shape of the phone and I made some shapes. I mean, what can we do with the logo? And these are only some of the quick sketches that I did. So uh, some shapes, how can we hide like the speakers? How can it look on the front? And then I made uh, like this quick, big sketch and I said that's the shape that I want my phone to have that's the shape that is going to solve my problem because what I found is that when you use your phone most people use their pinky uh, finger to actually hold the phone so that's what I was going for I mean I, I saw some of the other designs and there were some gorgeous designs there were like a really good level of, of designs but what I see what I saw was that most of them didn't have like this space and this curve behind where you can actually hold the phone. So that, 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 that was uh, it, the central part of my design. And, and coming from that, well, the next thing I did was like readjust a bit the, ba the battery so it goes a bit uh, higher and it is on a 90 degree angle. And that, that was it. I mean, the first thing I did was I have solved the shape was to actually print this phone that I have over here, which is a solid phone. This is just like the shape. And again, I, I, I tested this. I, I carried this for another day, which was all the time that I actually had. And I also gave one to, uh, to my girlfriend, so she, she would be carrying it uh, also. And well, what I found out was that the shape, the back shape, enables the phone to actually be carried in the uh, in your back like really comfortable and it uh, generates a more ergonomic shape so that's what i was going for and once i already had that well it was only <laughs> solving the inside of the phone so that's kind of like the the, the story behind the design of my phone thank you that is awesome and the fact that you move the camera over uh, to the left so that the speaker could be to the right of that. That was interesting. I did not give anybody permission to do that and you went ahead and did it and it looks great. So I'm really impressed with that, uh, that you took license to do that. I also noticed uh, you have the microphone hole down at the bottom. Uh, and then I know uh, from looking at the design before, you have the second speaker on the back bottom of the phone. And I think that that's uh, brilliant as well. And then can you talk to me a little bit about the fingerprint? Uh, yeah, well, uh, again, it's it's about how people actually use this phone today and what people expect uh, phones to, to have. So uh, I was saying, I, I was making the renders and I was saying, how can I make people know that this is a phone? I mean, because if I only have a black screen or if I only have a color, people are going to look that, like this and they are not used to see a circle phone. So okay. how can I make it look like a phone? So that was the answer. I mean, what do phones have right now? Like fingerprints on the screen. So, and, and that was it. Fantastic. Uh, originally I had designed a fingerprint sensor uh, on our phone board. Um, but then I realized we could have it on the screen and it was taking up valuable real estate on our printed circuit board. Uh, so I, re I uh, eliminated that element um, for better or for worse. So, so it was exciting to me to have, to see you put it on the front of the display. That was, yeah. most people, uh, I think a lot of people, um, at least that are around me, they don't use that feature um, that, that you can have it on your, uh, display. So it's just kind of interesting to me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the goal of this was just to let people know that this is a phone. Uh, I, I know that some of the features that I have and, and I, some, uh, at the end of the day, this was most like a concept design. So I know that some of this 
won't get through to a final design, but I mean, I had to try. Definitely. It, it was just wonderful to see you do this. So let's go ahead and go to the next uh, picture because I believe you actually have several images here and I loved this image. Something about the, uh, what color would you call this, coral? Yeah, coral. Just gorgeous. actually, the, the, the color palette. My girlfriend helped me design it. I, we we like spent like two hours seeing colors and what did I wanted to project with my. They, they were they weren't random colors. We we actually had like a lot of options and I think there were like five colors that at the end that we chose. And yeah, this is also my favorite. So we uh, chose internally in our our team. We were thinking of doing. Um, this color but we were going to call it salmon and we were like nobody's gonna buy a color called salmon like a fish. <laughs> but, but like because we were thinking of like uh because we have mountains here that look blue so we were going to offer it in olympic mountain blue and pacific northwest salmon and <laughs> <laughs> People are like, no, we're not gonna buy that. Sorry. I think I think it looks great. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, what you guys are doing is you are breaking the rules. I mean, you you are making something completely new. So I mean, it, it looks good. It just works. This color is gorgeous. I I love it. And uh, yeah, coral. The word co coral doesn't bring it justice. Um, nice nice choice. Thank you. And I loved, you heard me rave about this last week, but I loved how you bowed out the headphone jacks on both sides. So you kept the uh, sleek design all the way around, the lofting from the edge all the way to the back uh, uh, rise. And uh, I don't even know what you would call that shape, but um, of the outer dimensions. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the the I, I think that the first design that it actually derived from was like the avocado phone that I had over oh, here. So yeah, yeah it, it was like an stylized version of the avocado phone. So yeah, <laughs> that's the story behind the shape. That. And yeah, the, the shapes of the the headphone jacks they they were I mean they, they were challenging because what I did first was like the loft uh, in the mm -hmm. back side of the phone. And then I found I saw that the jacks were actually coming out of the phone. So how can you hide that and still make it look like it's part of the phone? So that was the end result. And I, I am also I'm also quite pleased with the result. Yes, the and I've jacks. seen I've seen that on other uh, consumer products. Uh, so it was exciting for me to see here. Um, Gosh, I had one more question, but now I'm kind of blanking. And going back, oh, what uh, design software did you use? Software? Yes. SolidWorks. I mean, oh, well, uh, yeah, Solid SolidWorks, what it enabled, enables you to do, I mean, uh, as I already told you, I work in additive manufacturing. So SolidWorks mm -hmm. allows us to have a uh, foolproof models. I mean, if they are solids on the software, they are going to work and they're going to be printable models. So even though you might have some restrictions and some limitations in how can you make shapes, it's all about training and it's all about just uh, working with the software and trying to achieve something uh, that is going to be useful and that is going to be uh, printable in this case. And then these concept images, did you uh, mock them up in a different piece of software or did you do it in SolidWorks? No, they were, uh, I mean, SolidWorks does have a, an internal uh, rendering engine. However, mm -hmm. I used KeyShot for this. Okay. KeyShot, again, is another amazing piece of software. Yes. It is super easy uh, to understand the basics. Uh, I mean, you have to really use it for a long time to master it, but to get good results, you don't need that much, actually. I've the the concept images that I've seen rendered out of, uh, and I don't know if render is the word that you would use, but uh, created in KeyShot, they're just amazing. In, in KeyShot? Yes, in KeyShot, um, they're just I, really well done. 
So sorry, I, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, Keychat, Keychat is amazing. I mean, uh, and it's super easy to use. I mean, you just kind of, if you want a quick render, you just put it in there and drag the materials, drag and scene, and there you have it. And the lighting, it. yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and that's it. I mean, it's it's amazing how, uh, how fast can you work with Keychat. So let's go ahead and move on to the other images. Let's see the next one. And I really like, how did you, uh, did you superimpose this in her hand? Exactly. What, what we did is uh, I'm actually kind of uh, have like my lighting here at home. So what we did is my girlfriend helped me because that's obviously not my hand. My hands are not like as smooth as those. So <laughs> she, she just posed it and with the phone. And yes. then what we did is uh, uh, I put that image into Keyshot so it can match the perspective and the illumination. And then in Photoshop, like we kind of put everything together. That That's like the quick uh, steps that we took. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not as fast and not as easy, but yeah, that was it. it. It's excellent. Let's look at the next one because I think the next one she's holding it from the, oh, this is, uh, so I have a question above the display. It looks, are those screws? Yes, they, they okay. were the screws. I mean, uh, originally this image was going to be larger, but because of the format that I had to use the, the square mm -hmm. format, I mean, it came out like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love seeing <laughs> pictures like this. So, and then you have the buttons on the left as well. Uh, you just did such a great job on this. May we see the next picture? That's exploded. And yeah. the dramatic exploded view. I love seeing these. Uh, you did a nice job labeling these. And I loved seeing the volume uh, button that you have here. Um, yeah. The, the bottoms are something that I would have more time to work with because mm -hmm. they were only like these basic volumes. So they are not quite as functional as I would have liked. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what I did focus on then is uh, the fact that they follow the shape of the phone because that's everything in my proposal. So if the phones kind of like stick out or they don't seem like they belong, mm -hmm. they would, I mean, just a simple button like that can break your whole design. So it's I was true. careful to follow the shape of the phone with the buttons. Lovely. Really lovely. Let's go ahead and see the next uh, picture. Yes. And I loved how you put the back camera just at the pinnacle of the inset here. It just came out so nicely. I really admired uh, all of the time that you took to uh, design the back of it. And especially with our logo there. Um, wow, that just makes me so proud <laughs> to see a logo on the back. So thank you for uh, that. At first, I was making, uh, actually, I did these renders before without the logo, and they didn't seem complete. There, there was something missing out of them, and I was watching it. Obviously, I mean, I there there you have it. There's, there's, this, there's a space for the logo in there, it's and so yeah, perfect. it just completed the design. And there's something I have to tell you, uh, confess, internally, I named this the egg drop because it had a lot of egg, it was very reminiscent of an egg to me because it had the flatter bottom, but a more pointed top. And uh, especially the image on the back as well. I, I prefer your um, description of the avocado. I didn't even think of that. And so then to have the logo be the seed or the yolk, uh, depending on your metaphor there, <laughs> um, just uh, was, just perfect. It was natural. There was something really natural about it. And I love seeing it there. And then we always struggle on, you know, where we should put all of our FCC information, um, you know, all the numbers that you see on the back of the phone. And um, definitely just below that inset, we could put it there, we could put it even in the inset. Um, there's d definitely uh, two or three uh, stripes of lines that we need to put on the back of each phone. And, um, so uh, it's exciting to have space there for that. So uh, on the bottom, you have your uh, palette. Uh, so, so that was really cool to see. Um, let's go ahead and look at the next picture. And Teresa, I know you're there in the background. Thank you so much for hanging in there. Uh, so it's 
uh, it's really cool to see the different colors kind of laid out here. And again, did you just uh, do all of these in Keyshot? Yeah, all of this, all of the rendering and all of the uh, these images were made in Keyshot. All the compositions, uh, they were in there. The, the purpose of this image was to show how can the works the, the colors work together and, and, how, and how do they look once you put them all together. And yeah, again, uh, 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 the coral color just stands out. But, it just pops. Yeah, it pops. It totally pops. Um, and then can we see the next picture? Because I think you have, yes, this is my favorite shot. So again, did you just have her hold the black model and then you superimpose the coral one? Exactly. And with the rings, it just, um, just fantastic. And the fact that her nail polish uh, was not perfect, it was like perfect to me. <laughs> it yeah, because so human and it looks so everyday. And it, it made me want to get to know her. It made me want to ask her about her phone. It made me like, I, I just, it's so inviting. So uh, to, you know, sometimes there's these uh, pictures that they have of women holding products and they just look so polished. And I'm like afraid to talk with them, but like, no, I wanted to ask her more about her phone and uh, it, it was just perfect. So yeah, nicely yeah. done here. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I also love this shot. I mean, the, the idea came because we were actually shooting the photos and then she held it like that. And I, I was in, stay like that. I mean, I need to get that picture and again, <laughs> Everything was so fast. I mean, this render, I made them, uh, the deadline was on Friday. So these were made on Thursday night. So wow. there, there was no room to polish your nails. There wasn't room <laughs> to actually go and do like a whole uh, photo shooting. So, I mean, yes, but but I do believe, I, I, I do believe, like you said, like this is a really human uh, yeah. result, like a really something that you can relate to. Yes totally relate to and uh it made the phone even though we're making an unusual phone uh you know sometimes there's a stigma with having an unusual phone uh it having it just be too unusual and it looks more casual here it looks so uh just every day like of course i would have a phone in this shape you know kind of, exactly like, doesn't everybody everybody has one like this you know so i just uh i loved it please thank her for her participation in this yeah really I mean. appreciated it. um and then do we have any more images after oh yes this and this was good too yeah, and uh, seeing it in your hand as well uh, really helped give it perspective. So the difference between seeing it in a, a woman's hand and then in a man's hand too uh, really helped. Um, and I think uh, men are very fond of watches. So having that watch, you know, kind of peek out, I think that's a watch or is that a sleeve? Mm, I do believe that was a watch. It was mm -hmm. my, my Xiaomi band. Yes. So there's something about uh, men who have watches uh, and something about them holding a phone. Um, you know, uh, watch, uh, tie clip, and of course, cufflinks are kind of the last vestiges of um, hardware for men. How can I say that? Uh, and so uh, it's really uh, cool to see those uh, types of elements in, in shots with uh, consumer electronics. But so thank you for that. Great. And uh, thank you, Teresa. <laughs> um, so I loved seeing the the enclosure 3D printed, and it looks like you used a lot of support material for this. So can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yes, I mean, when you work, I mean, there's there's also a downside to actually working with industrial 3D printing or industrial additive manufacturing. You kind of get used to it, okay? Because if I want to print this in my job, I mean, this doesn't require supports. So sometimes, and especially when you are working as fast as I had to for this design, you kind of forget that uh, you have some limitations with other technologies. So uh, yeah, the phone, uh, once I had finished printed, because this was the, the solid phone was actually printed uh, split, split into half and then okay. just glued together. Okay. So 
for the actual uh, enclosure, the, mm -hmm. the final design, yes. What I wanted to test is if you check in the design, I have like a small lip in, I mean, it, it's going to be really hard to see it in here, but it does have a small lip all around Thank you, Teresa. the edges. I mean, okay, can you show us one more time the small yep. lip inside the edge? Uh, there's a small lip that goes all around the edge of the uh, phone and it's also okay. on the front cover. So what I wanted to test is that that's a really thin piece of plastic. So I wanted to test if it actually, uh, if I could actually print that on an FDM machine because I knew that that was going to be like the, the test for the phone. And it actually came out great. I mean, once you once you find where do you have to put the phone together, it doesn't come out. So that's what I was going for uh, with that printing orientation. I mean, so as you can see, once you put the phone together, it, it is going to be really hard for it to actually move. So that's what I want. That's what I wanted to test with this uh, orientation in printing. I knew that all the back part because I know. Uh, you, if you have less than 45 uh, degrees angle in the overhand, you are going to need supports. So mm -hmm. uh, that was something that was inevitable for this for this design. And I also wanted to test how did the uh, battery and the microphone and the speaker uh, spaces actually worked and actually looked once printed. So that was behind my decision for printing the phone in this way. There was a plan for actually printing it uh, in this way so it would have like a better finish, especially on the back. However, that print, I think that it was like 12, 13 hours yes, long. Exactly. So it, there was no time again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was made on a Thursday night. So th there wasn't time, there wasn't enough time. For Definitely. That. Definitely. And so I have to ask about that lip. Is it less than a millimeter thick? I think it is. It is, I think, uh, three quarters of a millimeter because I okay. think that I used one point one one and a half millimeters mm -hmm. for the overall mm -hmm. thickness of the mm -hmm. of the enclosure. So it's a mm -hmm. half and a half once you put it on the on the covers. So for reliable prints, at least, and I see you have a Prusa, I have a Creality. Uh, for reliable prints, I have to limit myself to 1.5 millimeter thickness. Uh, if I go down below that, uh, it's just it just doesn't print reliably. And even at 1.5, uh, some of the dimensions that I print, uh, it doesn't like, uh, and uh, it is difficult. But yeah, uh, yeah, it, it can get difficult, and especially, I mean, uh, it, it can be once you start going into those really thin surfaces, mm -hmm. when the, the printer only does one, 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 one layer in there, mm -hmm. so it can be like really fragile. I mm -hmm. mean, if you if you if you call it like that, but mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to test with this, and I mean, it's been more than two weeks and it hasn't broken, so. I think exactly. for, for this test, definitely. <laughs> That's really good. And I'm super miserly, so I don't print with support material. So I'm always amazed when I see people using support material uh, to support very delicate items. Um, I've tried doing support material for our SIM card tray. I end up destroying the SIM card tray every time I try to break off the support material. It's, it just makes me cry. And so I don't use a lot of support material, uh, one, because I'm cheap and two, because I know that, you know, nobody's seeing the phone. It's just protecting it for our team and then to show it off to people who just want to try it. Um, but your design, in my mind, cries out for uh, a more sophisticated process than uh, uh, just uh, consumer 3D printing. So, uh, you know, for example, printing at your business with the multi-jet, uh, definitely that would be a great solution. Um, and then also injection molding. So, yeah, um, I mean, obviously there are some things I think that this phone doesn't have any problem with uh, drafts. Mm -hmm. However, those are things that you should have uh, to consider once you go into injection molding. And yeah, I mean, 
I haven't been able to talk with my boss to see if we can print one of these on the <laughs> on the MGF, but uh, uh, I think I will. Maybe maybe we can place an order with you. Yeah, it would be great. I, I, I think I can I can I can convince him. <laughs> that would be great. Well, let's see if we can bring. Yes, go ahead, Teresa. You're on mute. <laughs> there we are. If that happens to work. I would love, we would love to, I don't know, like FaceTime with you because I would be thrilled to watch. I don't know if it like is a watchable thing, but I'm fascinated to like see how it works yeah. and if we see how it works on our phone. A time oh, lapse, I don't know if you can do that, but no uh, idea. I don't know if you have a camera on the printing process, but, um, and then do we still have Nick with us or did he have to excuse himself? Okay, great. Can yeah. we bring... I'm sorry, can we make sure that we covered every single picture of Eduardo's? Do we have any more pictures after the 3D printing? Uh, no. images? Okay, I, I was pretty sure that was the last one, but I, I couldn't remember exactly. So great, so fantastic. Nick, thank you so much for staying on. So, um, and I'm, I deeply apologize because I'm actually going to <laughs> argue with you a little bit, even though you stayed on, Nick, about, Injection molding. So I, first, I want to make sure you're not on mute. Uh, okay. Think... Thanks. All right. <laughs> um, so six years ago, when I first got started, I heard for injection molding, you need to have a thousand units or more. But then in the last two years, I've heard more injection molding manufacturers talk to me and say that they can get it down to 500 units. So can you, uh, and you said uh, several thousand units, but you're also in the automotive industry and they make, you know, in the several thousand uh, unit mark. Millions of unit marks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So in your mind, uh, how far down could we go with that? So, so when a company is um, just testing out parts, they make prototype tools. So mm -hmm. a prototype tool is going to be all aluminum, uh, it's going to be um, generally hand stripped. Uh, so it, with a proper run of uh, injection tool, there's um, either there's knockout. So something that's going to come up and hit the part out of the mold. And then it's going to either uh, be picked up by a robot or drop down onto a conveyor belt with a prototype tool. Gen depending on the complication of the prototype, we might have a uh, ejection system, but generally it'll uh, eject and then someone's just going to take the part off or okay. you'll open it up. The person takes it out and then they kind of like tap off any sort of like we put loose inserts and loose pieces of metal that are there to just form the undercuts. So someone will hand strip those out and you have a part. So okay. those are on the the like lower like hundred part runs, five hundred part runs, things like that. Okay, we have a company in Seattle called GM Nameplate, and they do some of that, but I think they do it on a lower scale. Uh, you know, you're in the several thousands, and uh, I think that they would typically do uh, the lower thousands, or you said in the millions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that they're in the thousands. Uh, and we've looked at them for assembly, final assembly for our phone as well. Um, so is there any other thing to keep in mind for injection molding? Uh, for example, uh, we would be putting the numbers on the back. So would you... you something that fine, you wouldn't stamp it on the back? What would you? Uh, so it's called <laughs> acid etching. Uh, so so when you look, you can grab basically any plastic part in your house and there there should be uh, a code on it, like a PCABS, a anything that, so it, it tells you what type of plastic it is. It There's gonna be a date grid or a, a, a circle on it that has um, a one to 12. And it's there. That's your your date wheels. Um, okay. So date wheels are special. They're like built into the machine. But anything else, it's just acid etching. So what a company does is they come in and they put a sticker on your your metal. And then they pour acid on it, and then the acid eats away at the metal. And then that because it's it's um, 
uh, what it does to the metal, that will translate to your plastic part. And so for that, you can have, uh, I believe you can go as low as uh, two mil tall letters. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's, so, that sounds, sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, limitations. Uh, so the thickness of your part compared to your your ribs, your support ribs, mm -hmm. is uh, you can't have a one-to-one -one thickness. So if you have a three mil part, your okay. ribs have to be 40% of the thickness of your part. So it, so you can't have do a one mil wall stock and then expect to have a rib because the rib's not going to fill. The plastic just won't be able to get into that rib. So uh, a lot of the parts we deal with are, are like three mil, two and a half mil, three mil thick parts. And just so you can get proper ribbing inside there. Otherwise it's, it's not going to fill. Um, and if you go over that 40%, you see what's called a, a sink. And so the, as the plastics, um, cooling, uh, there's, it's basically your, your plastics here with your rib down, the ribs just going to suck the plastic in. So you'll see, uh, you'll get a V in your plastic and that'll be shown on your, uh, what we call the A side of the face. The A side is the, the show face. Okay. So on like a, a front fascia or a door panel you don't mm -hmm. want to see these these right. shadow lines all through it so we need to be beautifully smooth yes exactly. so we need to make sure that all the ribbing um is is 40 percent of that total wall stock okay and then typically your molds are metal i yes. assume mm -hmm. so uh we had uh, one of our early mock-ups uh, CNC out of a block of steel, mm -hmm. and, and that was really exciting for us. But it made me think about, um, you know, what goes into making those molds, those metal molds for the injection molding. Um, how long do those take to manufacture? Depends on size. <laughs> you know, I'm not an expert on uh, the manufacturing end of uh, so. So for machining wise, um, I'm not out on the shop floor, so I, I can't mm -hmm. answer that. <laughs> and then Eduardo, going back to the kind of the acid uh, wash for the numbers, how would that affect on, um, since since uh, your product is powder based, how would, would that still work? Yeah, I mean, you have a higher limit about uh, the level of detail that you can go. For example, for text, we recommend one one millimeter, uh, either uh, it is embossed or debossed, we recommend one millimeter height. Uh, so that that's where we know that we're going to have like a really good result. I mean, we have gone as low as 0.4 uh, millimeters and it still works. And mm -hmm. I think that the main advantage here when we are dealing with additive manufacturing is the fact that uh, you have like this level of personalization between each part that you can take advantage of. I mean, there have been uh, clients that come in here and tell us, well, I need like this part, but I need 50 of them and I need each one of them to have a different name or a different engraved, something like that. And something that is something that 3D printing helps you take advantage of. That's true because you can print it right on each model. Exactly. Uh, it, it does take some setup though to make sure that each one's different though, right? Exactly, um, I mean, uh, that, that's one of the advantages that we have, for example, with using SolidWorks. SolidWorks allows us to kind of, with obviously with some limitation, but it allows mm -hmm. us to, uh, if you have, for example, let's say that you want to put uh, 50 different names, you only mm -hmm. need an Excel sheet with all those names. And it's, from that, it's an automatic process. I really wish we could use that process because <laughs> it's like our perfect number. And then it's, you know, um, just all of the customization that you can uh, do, especially since we're just in, you know, that 500 to a couple thousand uh, range uh, for our particular product. And so, um, yeah, I just wish we didn't have that antenna issue. And I know that a lot of smartphones get around that by um, everything but the antenna piece, you know, maybe in a different uh, 
material. So like I talked about um, previously, for example, the iPhone 4 had that metal strip around the edge, but then it had the um, plastic front and back. And then um, nowadays we have the glass back on a lot of, of the um, phones that we have now. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, really hard. And the other thing that we've struggled with is having uh, recyclable enclosures. So for example, if we're able to make it out of TPU, uh, that's a substance that can be injection molded. Please check me here, Nick. Okay. Um, and and uh, are there any other substances that we should be looking at that can uh, be injection molded as well as uh, 3D printed that you know of, Nick? Uh, ABS. Um, of course, yes. Uh, PC ABS. Uh, what do you think of PETG? Uh, you know, I've never actually um, 3D printed with PETG. Uh, sorry, I take that back. I've tried it once. It didn't go very well. <laughs> <laughs> My settings were awful. And uh, so I got a part out of it, but uh, I wasn't very satisfied. And I just, the roll sits in a box and I haven't gone back. <laughs> Because exactly. once, once you live through that nightmare, you don't want to do it again. I totally yeah. get that. Yes, uh, that's another reason why I print mostly in PLA here, too. So yeah. it's so just easy. Easy, easy. Yeah, PLA, it's easy. It's low odor. It's it's good. And, you know, low shrink, that's, uh, that's a big thing with it. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, other than that... Uh, with plastic injection PETG, I don't have much experience with it. Okay, and then um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about, um, or at least point out, Eduardo, when I was looking at the HP machines, one of the things that I really, really liked about it, and I'm not quite sure uh, about the particular models that you have uh, at your business, um, but I know the HP uh, 580 boasted about any powder that's not used it goes through the machine, it is recycled, and then it's used again. And so it's really low waste. And, you know, especially when I do 3D printing, you know, I always end up with stuff all over the place. And I think, gosh, it wouldn't be cool to recycle this. And, uh, you know, in theory, PLA is supposed to be commercially compostable. You can't put it in your backyard co compost, but the commercial uh, composters uh, have a temperature high enough that it will compost successfully at. It's usually corn-based, uh, as long as it's not mixed with any other things that probably the shiny filaments probably are not <laughs> environmentally <laughs> friendly. Uh, but... Uh, you know, you, you can definitely source that and, and figure out, you know, which PLA is. But can you talk to us a little bit about the environmental impact of the HP machines that your business uses? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the same principle applies to all the machines. I mean, the technology is similar. Uh, what we do is we, uh, we have our volume, what we call our printing box, and then it puts it puts powder into the whole uh, the whole area. I mean, the whole area is covered with powder. So what it does, it sprays only where you want actually to build the part. And all the excess powder is something that you put back into the machine. I mean, once you have finished printing, mm -hmm. uh, we say that we play to be the archaeologist because we have to actually take out the pieces and, it, uh, and they are covered with powder. So yeah, what we do is we take out the pieces and figure this as if this was covered with a really thin uh, white powder. Uh. So what we do next is we brush it we just clean it and that powder cannot be recycled because it has it, it uses two components one for when you are when you want the pieces and another uh, which is called uh, the detailing agent which is used around the piece to help you have like a really good uh, surface detail so that powder that is directly next to the piece that cannot be recycled and that has to be thrown away but the rate at which we used uh we use actually used powder to new powder is 80 50 no is 85 percent to 15 percent so we only use 15 
percent new powder when we print. Oh, wow. Yes, the rest of the powder is powder that has already been through a process of heating and uh, cleaning. Okay, that's so remarkable. When I learned, so I, I just started looking at them in the past week and uh, these HP machines, and I was I was really impressed with that. Uh, a lot of people have already known about these machines for a long time, but I, I really didn't think that they were applicable to our product until, until someone brought them up again last week. And so then I did another deep dive into them and, or not deep dive, probably shallow dive. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then realized, yeah, uh, with the carbon, I wish that they had another adhesive there, but the carbon really makes it strong. Uh, and so you can have super thin and very detailed uh, prints that are super duper strong. So Nick, can you talk to us about injection molding? So what do you do? Do you have a lot of excess? Uh, and what do you do with that excess? What happens there? <laughs> Honestly, do we have a lot of excess? No. Um, it depends on the material. You can regrind the material because uh, with um, injection molding, it comes in pellets. And so the pellets are, are uh, put in a hopper and then the hopper uh, feeds down into a giant screw. And the, as the screw is spinning, it's it's spinning it through a bunch of different heaters. And so by the time it gets to the end of the screw, that's when it's going from your platen, um, from your, your uh, injection molding machine into the mold itself. Um, so your, your waste, depending on the material, could be little because you could regrind everything. Some materials can't be reground, it all depends. Um, but what you would be looking at don't think you'd have an issue with with regrinding the material that you would be looking at. Um, and then, so essentially, if it's not reground, uh, the waste is going to be whatever like runner length or um, what's left inside the the screw itself. Because mm -hmm. after the machine is after the molds taken out, you have to purge all your plastic because you don't. You need to make sure you're not mixing ABS with with whatever the next mold is going to have. So right. there is waste. If you can regrind it, then you're you're saving a lot, quite a bit actually. And then for injection molding, do you see any new technology coming down the pike that we may see in the next like five years, or that you're hoping for? <laughs> so. No, not for for making the mold, yes, but mm -hmm. not for the, and I could be completely wrong. I'm not an expert with uh, the future tech. I do know that we, um, that you could potentially uh, get a 3D printed uh, metal piece that becomes your mechanism that, that molds, that, that creates uh, a feature on the part. And so we could, if we can 3D print um, this component, then uh, it will, it takes a while, but we could get better cooling to certain features because all, all our cooling lines, it just, it's very linear. We have to drill in this way and drill out that way. So if you have a, a part that's kind of shaped like this and your cooling line can only come through here, you don't get any cooling in this plastic, but with 3D printed, you could have a, a line that curves. So it, it would- You're talking about 3D printing the molds? 3D printing the, the metal like lifter head, like the not the whole mold itself. Right. That would take a very long time. Yes, exactly. Because like, it's, it's um, like 3D printing metal is, is putting a powder down and then lasering the powder. Um, so, that's kind of something that I, I know that uh, I've heard talk about. We've, I think the company that I work for has uh, kind of looked at it, but it, that could be something. But for a change in actual injection molding, well, I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's interesting to me. Um, uh, early on, Six years ago, uh, we were in conversations with uh, 
company here in Seattle that they make molds. And this was early on in that technology that they, I think they made them out of carbon based uh, material, but they 3D printed them and then they would sand them and make sure that they were perfect. But that way you would get an inexpensive mold for injection molding. And I know now there are several companies that do that, but what's your opinion on that? I mean, it doesn't seem, it seems like there's a high rate of variability uh, for those molds. So no matter, see, that's the thing uh, with making a mold, um, a machine for, for cutting is only gonna be so per precise. So no matter what, we still have to have people go and hand work. So they're taking uh, a very fine um, like emery cloth and, and they're, they're working down the metal to get all the cutter marks out no matter what. So if you could okay. 3D print a mold okay. and it's, I guess 3D printing gives you a different avenue because you're very limited with machining now. Now that we have five axis machines, because machining used to just be very like, you come down and you do this. Now we can come to the side. And yes. With it's a five axis machine, it's amazing what we can do. But with 3D printing, you have so much more that you could do because you you don't have to get a spindle to come in on an angle and, and get that. So mm -hmm. it, it depends on, if it's very complicated process, that might be the way to go. But if it's just a standard, like here's your chunk of metal and it's a very simple thing to machine, mm -hmm. hands down machining it every time is gonna be faster okay. every single time. So I didn't realize because I thought the the molds themselves were actually CNC'd machined and I didn't realize you had to touch them up afterwards. I thought it was a done deal once it was, um, just after we experienced that block of uh, steel being carved into our phone. Um, but of course that was a very, you know, exterior, uh, dis, um, cut, cut away. Uh, right. it wasn't the interior, which I assume molds typically have. Um, and then Eduardo, this is where, uh, 3d printing really excels, right? You can do kind of all those different shapes and even shapes with hollows in them that, uh, are difficult to do on injection molding sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Like like Nick said, uh, one of the most inter interesting applications that we have, for example, is robotics. In robotics, sometimes you need to have like uh, mm, like hoses and things that go inside the pieces. So the good thing about 3D printing is that it allows you to have all those components into the same piece. So mm -hmm. It is going to help you things uh, like, for example, with cooling, like with the molds, or to make something that uh, maybe you need some hydraulic application. It can also help with that. I mean, so so yeah, the the uh, the liberty uh, and the freedom of design that you can achieve with three uh, D printing and with that added manufacturing, it's the main selling point. It should be the focus when you are dealing with uh, with three uh, D printing because. As Nick said, again, if you just have like a chunk of metal and you have like a really basic shape, I mean, you already have some other manufacturing methods that are going to help you with that. But if you have like really complex piece, that's where you have to uh, start find the value of 3D printing. It's true. And if you're only doing, you know, less than a million. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and a lot of people think that three D printing is here to actually like substitute other uh, manufacturing methods, and that's not true. I mean, three uh, D printing is only going to help and complement right. those right. other manufacturing methods. Definitely complement. I was going to say supplement, but complement is actually a better is a better word for that. Um, and then can you talk to us, uh, so when I was learning about the HP machines, can you talk to us about the different uh, materials that you can have? So you can have the different powders. Um, you had, uh, I think there was more flexible ones and there were more rigid ones. Can yeah, you talk exactly. about that? Yeah, the, the good thing about the HP materials for the uh, multi-jet fusion machines is that it has an open uh, platform for materials. That means that anyone with 
enough resources can start developing a material for these machines. Uh, when they first uh, launched the machines, there were only three materials, which is the uh, PA12, PA12 with glass beads and PA11. So those were the only materials that you could choose. That you could choose. What we did here in my company is we chose PA12, which is like a, a middle point between the two others. PA12 mm -hmm. with glass beads is a bit harder and it's a bit less flexible. And mm -hmm. PA level is a bit more flexible with better uh, finish. But PA12 is like a middle point between those. And so far, they have already released TPU. So you can already print TPU on an HP machine. And I think that polypropylene was already released uh, okay. this year. Okay. I know that on the future, they have like a bunch of materials planned, but I don't really know when uh, each one of them is going to, to actually come out. Yeah, it's, it's really hard for us to tell. And there are, um, maybe I mentioned this already, but uh, an amalgamation of plastic and metal uh, for uh, uh, mobile phone backs uh, available now. Um, Nick, have you come across in the automotive industry, have you come across with an amalgamation of plastic and metal uh, for any of the parts that you deal with? Um, yes, so uh, when we're doing, um, it's called over molding. Like it's, so I guess, we're not an am amalgamation of plastic and metal. Like we're still only injecting plastic, okay. but uh, what we'll do is um, say a piece needs to have, uh, you can't just have um, threaded plastic. You need a, a nut that's inside the piece because uh, something's getting mounted to it. We'll actually put a metal nut inside the, the machine. So the, the press will open up, we'll, put all the nuts inside, it'll close, and then the plastic will get injected around it. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Okay, so that they're embedded. Exactly. That's really valuable. So we're coming up on uh, an hour and 15 minutes. So I just want to be respectful of both of your times. I really appreciate you coming on. I, as Teresa knows, I want to talk about this all day long. <laughs> she will. <laughs> That's right. I, so, uh, well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, our show and talking to us about your designs and what inspired you and uh, kind of the thought process that you went through while you were creating the design. And then also your backgrounds. So uh, for us getting to know the people, behind the designs is actually maybe surpasses sometimes than the design itself. So uh, we really enjoyed getting to know more about you today. And do you have any other comments for us uh, before we close out today? It's okay if you don't. <laughs> no, <laughs> no we've, I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. I mean, I think that what you are doing, it's amazing to give us a platform to actually speak about what we do about ourselves. That's that's amazing, and I want to thank you. And um, let's make it work about uh, printing one of these and actually seeing, uh, transmitting the printing process so you guys can, can watch how, how it's actually made. That would be fantastic. And Nick, if you can ever <laughs> figure out how to injection mold ours, I... <laughs> I'll get back yeah. to you. <laughs> if we hit in the millions, I will be caught. I will be calling you. When? When we when? hit? Uh, when? <laughs> before, before we close out, um, please pardon the voice. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of singing in the car the other day. Anyway, um, before we close out, all of those who joined us live and all of you who are watching um, whenever it is currently. Hope you have a good day. A um, couple things. Please make sure to like, follow, and on YouTube, subscribe um, to us. We have a bunch of platforms. Um, won't lie. That was one of the things when I got this job that I was like, cool, marketing, social media manager, new gig. Okay. And then um, Christina was like, and here's the list of things. You've got 
Instagram, <laughs> you've got Twitter, we've got LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Pinterest. Um, so here on our website, um, we're down at the bottom right now. So I want to highlight our phone is unique as you. Non-rectangular phone for non-rectangular people. The cell phone, the rope, well, yeah. The circle phone <laughs> exists to inspire a world where you can be you, whatever shape you are. Come as you are, come as you wish. So here on the website, also, you can sign up for a launch event. We are launching soon. This is not just a concept. This is a thing coming to you soon. So if you want to know when, you want to be kept up to date, just put your stuff in. Yes, like if you have to pay for texts, um, it'll be a small amount, but we won't be sending you very many. So please sign up if you wish. Um, See, I have like the circle phone. What was that? It'll jump you oh, back. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so, so there's that. Um, and then also down at the bottom, the <laughs> here you can sign up for a general newsletter, which is different from the launch alert. Um, and then like, follow, subscribe, um, specifically our Facebook and Instagram. Um, since we're heading toward a launch, I'm really trying to get, you know, more in engagement and really like be with y'all. Um, so Facebook, we're gonna have fun quizzes um, and highlight other local businesses and women and whatnot. Um, and we're gonna have some giveaways, some contests, etc. cetera. Um, also, last thing, um, if you want to get us to know better, get to know us better, um, I just made a new Instagram called The Social Circle with a Y. Um, so there it'll just be like behind the scenes things, um, funny images that my mom takes of me laying on the floor to take a pretty picture of the phone, that kind of stuff, as well as non-rectangular personal activities like I consider getting tattoos, which somebody commented on. So uh, <laughs> there you go. I can see they're getting tattoos like one of my non-rectangular things. So there's like a tidbit of that on there or there will be later today. All right. Spiel over. Thank you for being here um, very much. Thank you, Nick and Rada. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, Christina, anything you, <laughs> you've got? No. And uh, next time we'll have Eduardo and Nick uh, show us their tattoos on the show. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. So everybody, send us your tattoos. I bet they're beautiful and they're uniquely you. So <laughs> that'd be awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, Nick and Eduardo. Really appreciate your time today, and uh, thank you for submitting your designs. We loved love seeing them. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. All the best, everybody. Take care. Bye.